Passionate prayer means that you pray with full belief and commitment to the truth that God is intimately involved in every prayer that we do with someone else and for ourselves. The prayer team exists because we believe in what Paul says in Philippians chapter four, which are life verses for me that were important in my life long before I became a pastor, especially when he says, in all things by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Shoreline believes that as a church. I believe it as a person. When people pray for me, I can, I feel it. I, I notice it. It's not something that they just say, oh, I'm gonna pray for you for this and that. But I actually feel that they have done that prayer. So I know that in my life, it's been an incredible gift and a blessing to be prayed for. So I feel that it's, um, I certainly can give back and provide that same thing for other people. It doesn't come from myself, and I'm surprised sometimes where people have come back and they've said that was exactly what I needed to hear, and it's overwhelming to me. Again, it goes back to to be His vessel with the, the with the Holy Spirit and the love of Christ, and to to not look at myself with my own issues and and carry another people's burdens because He's carried so many of mine. So if somebody needs prayer, maybe you're watching this now and, and you've thought, I, I'd like to, I'd, I, I really need prayer, but I don't know how to do it or how does one begin? You can come up on a Sunday, speak to a pastor and ask for prayer. You can watch our services online and you can put in the chat room a request for prayer. You can write the church, you can email the church, you can call the church, or if you see us out around town, you could approach us and say, hey, can I, can I ask for prayer? And absolutely, all those venues are available to you. Our encouragement is if you haven't yet sought prayer, please take that first step forward. It's an honor for us. ago Saturday Sherry and I were doing our hike through the Toro Hills locally here and early on in the hike we ran into two different people from Shoreline Church and in both cases we stopped and chatted and we ended up praying with both of them on the trail uh, because you can pray anywhere you, you get listening to Dennis and actually Dennis is doing a training today at one o'clock if you want to be part of our prayer ministry one of our prayer team members that we have after the services and that pray throughout the week and also we've got a tent out in the courtyard uh, where you can sign up and learn more about praying uh, for Organic Outreach International, a ministry that was birthed out of Shoreline Church. Uh, we were just in Kenya a couple months ago, uh, trained over 300 pastors in Kenya who were impacting thousands of people, and our prayer team for Organic Outreach International was praying for that training in Kenya. So if you want to pray globally and locally, one o'clock training today with Dennis, and then after the service in the courtyard or online, you can just call in and say, how do I learn about being part of those two prayer ministries? You, you almost get the impression by listening to Dennis and seeing what happens around here, you almost get the impression that we believe in prayer. I mean, what, what, if, what if God actually hears our prayers? The prayers of his church, the prayers of his people, scattered, gathered. What if our prayers move the heart of God and move the hands of God? I mean, what if prayer it's not only like something we can do, but something that God hears and God responds to. And we believe that here at Shoreline Church. We believe in the power of prayer. Uh, this congregation's story is a story of answered prayers. Years ago, there were people in the Monterey Peninsula area that were praying. There were lots of great churches in Monterey, but there were people that were praying, God, would you begin a church that's a different kind of a church, a church where someone can walk in who's not church, who doesn't know about how all this stuff works, and they just feel welcomed and loved. A church where the message is so clear that somebody might say, you know what, I don't really agree with what you, you believe, but I certainly understand it. <laughs> and just crystal clear. People were praying, God, would you start a new church in Monterey? And the Spirit of God stirred a guy named Howie Hugo and his wife Linda and their children to come and be part of this Monterey community, to plant a church here in Monterey. And if you were to ask Howie Hugo, when this church, when Shoreline Church was first being planted about tw almost 28 years ago, why did God call you to plant a church here in Monterey? And what's on your heart with this whole new church thing? Howie would have told you, I feel called to plant a church for people who don't like church. That's what he would have said. For people who don't, don't get the whole church thing. 
Because God's heart is for people who are very, very far from Jesus and for people that know him well. And so even before this church started, people were praying. And then all through the history of the church, it's just been a, a, a series of answered prayers. The building that we're in right now, now we don't believe the church is a building. But this is our home base. Whether you're online, whether you're on campus, we, this Shoreline prayed for years to have a home base, a place that we could call home and kind of do our ministry from. And, and people were praying and crying out to God. And for a long time, Shoreline was just going from place to place. You know, one of the themes of Shoreline early on was, you're welcome to worship with us if you can find us. Because Shoreline kind of went from place to place to place, and some of you that have been around here for a while know exactly what I'm talking about, right? And, and yet God provided this place, an office complex and a, and a warehouse. This was a warehouse, this worship center. This wasn't built to be a worship center, but God opened the doors through prayers. What if passionate prayers helped bring us to this place and provide this place? Because God hears and answers prayer. Many people who are part of this congregation before the carpet was laid in this building came in here and on their knees prayed for lost people, people that need to know Jesus in their family and their friends in their neighborhood in Monterey. And they wrote the names of those people around the floors here and around this building before the carpet went down. And through prayer and the power of God, many of those people have come to know Jesus and some are in heaven now. Some have come to know Jesus and they're walking with him today. And then there was a time where Pastor Howie and Linda started to realize it was their time to start to transition. And one of the toughest things to do in the life of a church is transition from a founding pastor, the first founding pastor, to a second pastor. And they started praying that God would bring someone to come and lead this church after Pastor Howie transitioned out of that role of lead pastor. And they actually brought me in to be a consultant and to help Shoreline design a process for a pastoral search, not to hire me as their pastor. They brought me in to help them find the next pastor and to work with them in that process. I was in the process of developing Organic Outreach International, was writing three books. I had stepped out of being a senior pastor. And every time I would come here to work with the church, they'd say, well, you should be our next pastor. And I'd say, well, God's called me to spend the next few years writing these books and preparing this global ministry to help churches learn how to share the gospel. And I'd come visit again, and I'd work with the church again. they said, well, you should be open to it. And I'd say, well, I'll pray. And I'd pray, and God didn't call me to be. And then I sat down with Pastor Dennis, who you saw on the screen a moment ago, for a lunch at Turtle Bay, which isn't there anymore. It was a little taqueria right in downtown Monterey. And, and he said, you know, I know you and Sherry have prayed about coming to be here, part of Shoreline. He said, but I really believe God wants you to be here. I said, well, I said, I said Dennis, I'll pray about it. I pray, I pray every time someone brings it up. He says, well, he says, he says, I know God wants you here. I'll just wait for you to catch up. <laughs> oh, my boss. Me right but <laughs> but yeah, I, said, I said, okay, we'll keep praying. And then as Sherry and I prayed, we felt like God said, be open to it. And here we are more than 13 years later. Still serving this congregation. Answers to prayer, right? Some of you were praying for me before you knew who your next pastor was going to be. When, when the church was started, there was a plan to put a beautiful courtyard out here for different things like you know, coffee and stuff, outdoor worship, different experiences, weddings and stuff. But there wasn't enough money or resources, so it didn't happen. People were praying, Lord, provide, provide. Didn't happen. When I came, I said, we gotta finish this court. It was just, it was just like dirt and dusty out there. I mean, it was really, it was just horrible. And, and, and I prayed and we, I said, but we didn't have the resources. He said, well, God didn't answer the prayer. No, God did answer the prayer. He said, hang in there and wait. Sometimes God's answer to prayer is hang in there and wait, but trust me. And do you know that God provided the money and the motivation to have that courtyard finished right before COVID hit? So when we need to do service outdoor, we could do it in a beautiful courtyard. God's timing is amazing. And can I tell you, over the last two years, God has answered so many prayers in the life of Shoreline Church. We're still here. We're still, still worshiping and celebrating Jesus' goodness. We're sh sharing the gospel with our community. Do you know that we have more people in worship on an average Sunday right now than we did pre-COVID if you take everyone online and everyone on campus? God is still at work, but that's an answer to prayer. And I'm gonna tell you one of my secret prayers the last two years. Here's been one of my prayers I've been praying regularly. Lord, with all the conflict, all the tension, all the people getting angry about things, Lord, will you take me through this whole COVID thing, all of the stuff that's involved in this last couple of years? I didn't know at the time it was a couple of years. I started praying, but God, will you help me through this time? This is my prayer, to not lose it with somebody. You know what I'm talking about? I've had people come after me about all kinds of stuff, and God has answered that prayer up to this point. I have, I, I'm not gonna tell you what's gone through my mind sometimes, what I've wanted to say sometimes, but I haven't lost it. I had one person for a half an hour basically yell at me and tell me what was wrong with me and wrong with the church, and God gave me the strength just to listen and say, well, you know, I think if we would have done it that way, it would have blown the church up. And this person said to me, well, then maybe the church should blow up. And I said, well, I don't think so. And, I, <laughs> and if you know me at all, I'm a pretty passionate person, but I have, I have not lost it. 
So will you keep praying that? Because I don't think we're quite done yet. <laughs> will you keep praying over these coming, coming couple? I'm praying in a couple of months things start to settle down. I, I, I'm hoping and praying that's happening. But answer to prayer. What if God actually hears our prayers? What if prayer has power? And I believe it does, and I know that many of you do as well. In this series called Organic Disciples, we're simply asking the question, what does it look like to study the life of Jesus and see how he lived his life? And as we study the life of Jesus, so we learned last week, Jesus was engaged in the Bible. So, okay, we learned from Jesus, how do you read Scripture? And then we say, what about me? How do I read Scripture and love Scripture like Jesus? And then how does loving the Scripture take me out with the message of Jesus to the world? This week we're talking about passionate prayer. So we're going to do the same thing. How did Jesus pray? How was he passionate about prayer? And as I learn from Jesus, I'm going to now live what I've learned. I want to become more a person of prayer who prays like Jesus. But how does my prayer life then take me out into the world to bring the love and the grace of Jesus? All of our spiritual growth, as we looked, you know, our model is Jesus, as we're transformed, that's not enough. It's not enough just to say, Jesus lived that way, I'm going to live like Jesus. Because Jesus always went to the lost and the broken and the forgotten and the wandering sheep. So when we grow in Jesus, become, learn from Jesus, become like Jesus, then we begin to live the good news of Jesus in the world. So today we're going to talk about prayer and how passionate prayer can change the world. So God, this is our prayer today. With all of our heart, we pray you would open our eyes to see, our minds to understand, our hearts to pray in new and passionate ways. And may there be things that happen in the weeks and months and years to come here in Monterey and around the world that happen because your people have prayed because we have sought your face and unleashed the power of heaven. So Spirit of God, speak to our hearts and grow us in passionate prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we begin with Jesus. And for Jesus, prayer was like breathing. It was a natural part of life. You don't even notice when you're breathing. Most of you are breathing, have been breathing through this entire sermon. If you haven't been, we got problems. <laughs> Right? We don't notice it. It's just part of what we do. For Jesus, prayer flowed out of who he was. I love in Luke chapter 5, verse 16, we read these words. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. If there was ever somebody who didn't need to pray, it was Jesus. He was God, Emmanuel, God with us. But Jesus prayed like he breathed. Jesus prayed in the flow of life, often he made space. Prayer in the flow of life for Jesus meant praying for meals and for miracles. The little things like a meal, the big things like a miracle. In Matthew 14, 19, when Jesus is about to feed 5,000 men plus women and children with a small sack lunch that some kid probably had his mom say, take this as you go out. And Jesus took this little, this, this, you know, a few loaves, of, you know, a, a, a few fish and multiplied it. But we read these words right before that, Matthew 14, 19. Looking up to heaven, he, Jesus, gave thanks and he broke the loaves and handed them out and broke the loaves and handed them out and broke the loaves and then the fish as well. And there was enough for everybody. Jesus prayed for meals. Do you still do that? Do you pause and thank the Lord for this, this gift of a meal? But Jesus also prayed for miracles. He prayed, multiply this little amount. And in the hands of Jesus and the power of prayer and the power of God, there was enough for everybody. Jesus prayed for the little things, a meal, and the big things, a miracle. And so should we. Jesus prayed across the emotional spectrum, from the heights of joy to the depths of sorrow. Jesus experienced the entire emotional range of emotions. And so Jesus prayed in the heights of joy. In John chapter 11, this is where, where Lazarus is raised from the dead. There, there was this, there's this family that lived in the city of Bethany, Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. And Lazarus had died. They called Jesus and asked him to come. And he didn't get there until after Lazarus had been dead for a considerable amount of time. And so Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead to bring air back into lungs that had not been breathing for days. And in John 11, verse 40, we read this. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone of where Lazarus was buried. Then Jesus looked up and he prayed. He talked to the Father. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. As he's praying, he's being a model to us, to them and to us. And then he raises Lazarus from the dead. 
But Jesus prays in this critical moment to the Father. The depths of pain, rejection, and sorrow, Jesus prayed. When Jesus hung on the cross, bearing our sins, taking our shame, dying in our place, as he hung on the cross, he said seven different things. Three of those things were prayers. As he's gasping for life, as the weight of his body and the weight of our sins are, are crushing the Lamb of God, this was one of his prayers, Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. What a prayer. From up on the cross, Jesus looks at those who had driven the nails through his flesh, those who had rejected him, those who had run away in his time of need. And he prays, Father, forgive them, because they don't get it. They don't know what they're doing. God, bring grace. That's the prayer of Jesus in the midst of pain and struggle and rejection and heartache. Jesus showed us prayer in the big moments of life. And almost every, if you read the Gospels, almost every time Jesus is about to do something big, look closely, because right before he does it, you know what he's doing? Praying. Over and over and over again. Before he calls his disciples in Luke chapter 6, what's Jesus doing? Praying for the wisdom of the Father. Before he reveals who he is in the transfiguration, he brings Peter, James, and John along with him to the mountainside. And before God speaks from heaven and says, this is my son, what's Jesus doing? He's praying. We just saw before he raised Lazarus from the dead, looks up to heaven, calls out to the Father. When Jesus is in the garden, right before he's going to go to the cross and take the sins of the world, what does Jesus do? He goes to this garden and he says, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Father, not my will, but yours be done. Father, not my will, but yours be done. Three times he prays. And he brings some of the disciples along with them. Asks them to stay awake. It's late at night. And pray. Then they dozed off. But he was trying to show them, this is how you live your life. You pray in those moments. And on the cross, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. For Jesus, prayer was like breathing. He talked to the Father all the time. What a model for us. What a picture of what it means to be an organic disciple. What is a disciple? We're, we're people who are like Jesus. We follow him. So you look at his life. Jesus prayed for you. Do you know that Jesus prayed for you when he was on this earth? In John chapter 17, in the Gospel of John chapter 17, the longest recorded prayer of Jesus in the Bible, the whole chapter, 17, is his prayer. He prays to glorify the Father. He prays for his disciples who were following him right then. And then he prayed for you and me. If you're a Christian, he was praying for you right then. Here's what Jesus prayed in John 17, beginning in verse 20. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, meaning the disciples that are there with him right now. So not just for my disciples now. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Those that will believe through the message and the witness of the disciples. Those disciples shared with people who shared with people who shared with people through the years, who shared with people when someone prayed for you and shared with you. And so Jesus prays for you and me, we who would come to faith in him through the message of the church and God's people through history, that all of them may be one. This is, this is John 17, 21. Here's his prayer for us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and as I am in you. He says, may the church be unified like the Father and the Son are unified. Listen to this. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus prays. He models prayer. He prays for us to walk in unity so that our lives and our unity can reflect to the world the presence of Jesus. If there's ever a time in the history of the world where Christians can model unity and show something the world isn't seeing, it's now. We may have differences and different perspectives, but we better stay united in Jesus Christ. And division should not come over any of the dozens of issues that we're facing right now in our culture. If, we are, if our hearts make us one in Jesus, we are one, even if we disagree on some stuff. Right? And Jesus says, then your lives of unity can reflect to the world. So movement one, as we look at each of these markers of growth, is just to look at Jesus. And for Jesus, prayer was like breathing. It's what he did. So movement two kind of comes to us then. We have to understand that God delights when his children talk to him. God delights when, when we pray, when we talk to him, when we cry out to him and share our needs, our joys. God delights. 
As Christians, we look at Jesus and his example, and we want to become like him. A disciple is somebody who follows the, ma- the, the, the master, Jesus. So you look and say, okay, I want to pray like Jesus prays. I want to talk to the Father more regularly. Now, this isn't a sermon on 20 ways to do that. This is helping us to understand this movement of spiritual growth. But we'll, we'll look deeper into this topic of prayer. I learned to pray. I learned to pray really most deeply by watching my wife over the last 37 years of our marriage. I, I've watched my wife before she had a double disc replacement in her neck and where when she was in excruciating pain almost all the time. Some of you didn't know Sherry at that time. But, but not that long ago where she would literally wake up every morning. My wife rolls out of bed onto her knees. She doesn't let her feet touch the ground before her knees hit the ground. And she seeks the face of Jesus. And she stays there until God says it's time to get up. It might be 30 seconds. It might be 20 minutes. And I watched my wife where she could hardly get out of bed because her body was just so filled with pain. And she would just spend her, her morning on her knees. See, I've, I've learned to pray by watching a, a godly woman of prayer, by learning from my wife. It can become part of your life, even in the pain, especially in the pain sometimes. But, but, but we're called to pray, and God delights in that. I want to give you a theological picture of what God has done to open the way for prayer. And that is the curtain is, the curtain is torn and the way is open. When Jesus is dying on the cross, when Jesus is bearing our sin right before he breathes his last, we read these words in Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 50. And, Jesus, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. That means at that moment he died. And here's what happened. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn, torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. There's this cataclysmic moment where all of creation begins to shake and something spiritual happens. Like the very hands of God have taken this curtain that is in in the temple area that was also in the tabernacle before that between the holy place and the most holy place, this giant curtain, and from top to bottom, it's torn in two. What's going on there? What's that about? That is an invitation to prayer, an invitation to the presence of God. Because there's the holy place here and the most holy place. And the Jewish people believed that in that most holy place where there was the Ark of the Covenant, on the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. And they believed above the mercy seat was the very dwelling place of the presence of God. And so nobody was allowed in that area except for once a year. Listen to these words from Hebrews chapter 9. I'll begin in verse 2. And it talks about the tabernacle and the temple, how how it was set up and how it worked. But listen to this. A tabernacle was set up And in its first room were the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain, this is this this giant curtain that's torn when Jesus dies, all right? Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the altar, the golden altar of incense, the gold-covered Ark of the Covenant. This Ark contained the gold jar of manna, Aaron's uh, staff that budded, and the stone tablets in the covenant. These are significant articles from the history of God's people. And above the ark were the cherubim of the glory overshadowing the atonement cover, the mercy seat, where they believed that God was dwelling. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. And then he goes on, listen to this. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room, the holy place, to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, the holy of holies, and that only once a year. Only once a year, the high priest would go to that most holy place and bring a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Once a year. And when the high priest went into that place, they would actually literally tie a rope around his ankle. He'd have bells on his clothing so they could hear him moving around. So that if the high priest passed out for some reason because of the glory of God or something, they would literally stand on the outside, take the rope, and they would drag the high priest out and under the curtain. Nobody else would go in there. They weren't allowed to. Once a year. That curtain that divided the holy place and the most holy place, the very dwelling place of God, when Jesus died on the cross, was torn in two from top to bottom. And God said, come to me. Not once a year, not just the high priest, the curtain is torn and the way is open. 
Just like Jesus talked with the Father as a regular part of his life, so we need to walk and talk with the Father. The invitation is to draw near to God and talk with him always. The God of heaven says, talk with me, I invite you in. That's why the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, says these words, just two words, pray continually. Pray continually. Talk to God all the time. My wife talks about how that passage always made her uncomfortable. She's like, oh, you mean I have to pray all the time? No, the point is not that you have to pray all the time. The point is you can pray anytime. I think of it like our home and our three boys and their wives and our, and our grandkids. If our family members showed up at our door anytime, any day, they wouldn't even knock. They all have a key. They'd walk in. And you know when they'd be welcome? When would my kids and my daughters-in-law and my grandkids be welcome at home? When would they be welcome? What's the answer? Anytime, all the time, any moment. And we're thrilled to see them. Drop in, surprise us. That's how God sees you. The curtain is torn. The door is open. He loves when you show up. He loves when you talk to him. It should be like breathing in our lives. And then God invites us to pure honesty. Whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind, you can talk to God about anything and everything because he knows your heart and he loves you. I love the Psalms, 150 Psalms, all of them prayers, all of them prayers. Some of them are prayers of celebration. Oh God, you're so good. Some of them are prayers of praise. Lord, your character, your being is worthy of praise. Some of the Psalms are laments, You know what a lament is? It's a cry of pain. God, I'm hurting. God, I'm lonely. God, I feel broken. God, I'm crying out to you, and I feel like my prayers aren't reaching you. God, will you hear me? God, I feel like I'm sinking in quicksand, in miry gunk, and I can't pull myself out. Help, God. There's more of those kind of prayers in Psalms than any other kind of prayer. Wait, wait, why would there be so many examples of that kind of prayer? Because life can be hard sometimes, and we can come to God. And bring our lament. And those laments will be, God, I'm hurting. God, I'm struggling. Yet I trust in you. I love you. But man, is this hard. Those prayers are right here in our Bible. Prayers of confession. God, I messed up. I'm sorry. I run back to you. Prayers of anxiety and worry and fear. They're all here in the Bible. So God invites you to come to him and talk to him about anything and everything. And then praying like Jesus. Jesus not only gave us a model of prayer, he showed us how to pray, but he also taught us how to pray. So we need to learn to pray powerful prayers like Jesus did. Man, pray for healing. Pray for miracles. Pray for God to break out and do amazing things. Some of you would say, well, I prayed for big things and it didn't turn out the way I wanted, so I just stopped praying that way. Don't stop. Don't stop. One of my biggest prayers took 43 years for God to answer, for my dad to come to faith in Jesus. But we prayed and prayed. And there was times I was like, man, I'm sick of praying for my dad. And God would say, just keep praying. Trust me. Sometimes God's answer is no. He's wiser than us. Some of the best prayers that God, I, I, I lift up through my life, God didn't, didn't answer. I mean, best. I thought they were great prayers. And like a year later, five years later, 10 years later, I look back and go, oh, God, thank you for answering that prayer with a no. I was praying about a person I was dating before I met Sherry, thinking that was the person. It was hard when the answer was no until I met Sherry. Thank you, Lord. You know? <laughs> but you don't know. Just keep praying. Keep praying. Don't give up. Powerful prayers. Only by prayer. Jesus, at one point, the disciples are trying to to deal with a spiritual battle. There's this person who's possessed. There's demonic presence, and they can't deal with it. Jesus casts the demon out, and they say, what's going on? And Jesus says, well, some things come only by prayer. And there's some spiritual battles that will only be won on your knees in prayer. So we need to pray that way, too. And then crazy prayers. What do you mean crazy prayers? Listen to these words from Matthew 5. Verse 43 and following. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Whoa. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Okay, okay, I'm gonna pray for those who persecute me. Okay, here I go, here I go. God, these people are persecuting me. Lord, get them. (laughs) Deal with them. Lord, bring some of that. Whoa. No, God, just, is is that the... But when you read, that's not the spirit of this prayer. That's not the spirit of this prayer. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Lord, will you change their heart? Lord, will you take their brokenness and heal it? 
Lord, would you open your, their eyes to see your grace and your presence? Lord, would you help me make it through this because this is hard to be persecuted? Can you pray like that? That's part of our journey of prayer. Audacious prayers. It's the prayers like, like, like Jesus talks in this story in Luke 11 where the guy who has some company show up in the middle of the night. He has no, not enough food for them, so he goes to his next-door neighbor, knocks on the door. Hey, I need some food. Can I borrow some food? Hey, I, I need some food. And the person's not responding. And Jesus says, just keep knocking. I mean, the, the story basically says, just keep knocking. Well, it's late at night. Keep knocking. Just keep praying. There's some prayers you had on your heart along the way that you stopped praying for. You've just gone, you know what? I prayed and prayed and prayed. Guess it's not happening. And keep praying. Audacious boldness. Keep knocking. Keep praying. God's doing something. Surrendered prayers. Surrendered prayers. Like Jesus in the garden before he went to the cross. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, Father, but yours be done. Third time, not my will, but yours be done. Pray in the will of the Father. And then evangelistic prayers, praying that the good news would spread through your family, through your friendships, through Monterey County, through this nation, through the world. And that's the third movement of every part of our spiritual growth. We look at Jesus and we learn. We try to become more like Jesus. But then in the name of Jesus, being transformed by his power, we start to live in a different way. So our prayers now need to be prayers that go outward. All right? How prayer changes the world, and prayer does change the world. Every one of us who's a follower of Jesus right now is a follower of Jesus because there were people praying for us. Someone was praying for you. In my extended family of over 100 people, I knew of only one Christian when I was growing up, my dad's mom, my granny. But she prayed for us, grandkids. And lo and behold, all five of the kids in my family, me and my, my three sisters and my brother, all have put our faith in Jesus. Every one of us. Three of us have gone into different kinds of ministry. And my dad, for years, my dad just went, where did I go wrong? You know, guess what, dad? Your mom was praying. She was praying. There's power in prayer. So prayer changes the world. And we need to pray for people that don't know Jesus. Keep praying for people that haven't come to faith in Jesus yet. Don't stop praying for them. Years ago, we had a conference here at Shoreline, and, and a, friend, a friend of mine and a friend of this church, a guy named Lee Strobel, who's written books on outreach and just a great brother, uh, Lee talked about, at this conference, and when he preached here, he talked about a, a simple prayer of, of a one 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 prayer. He said, just commit every day at one o'clock for one minute, pray for one person by name who doesn't know Jesus. One person one o'clock, one minute. My wife, Sherry, one o'clock didn't work for her because she had meetings, so she put hers at nine o'clock at night. So she, called, she, called, she calls it her 911 call, her 911 emergency call. Nine o'clock at night, one person, one minute. And she and I prayed together for my dad at nine o'clock at night, hundreds of times before I became a Christian. One of the pastors who was here at that conference, a guy named Steve Murray, who's the Organic Outreach International Leader for New Zealand. He was here from New Zealand to be part of the conference. And he actually, the last time I saw him, he said, oh, it's exciting, my 111 prayer, I'm on my third person. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the first person I wrote down to that conference, I prayed for that every day at one o'clock, they became a Christian. So I just added a new name on my phone. And when the alarm goes off, I pray, prayed for that person. They became a Christian. So now I'm on my third person. Is there power and passionate prayer more than we realize? There's things that happen in this world that wouldn't happen if people weren't praying. And I believe there's things that don't happen that could happen if we'd start praying. There's power in prayer. We need to believe that. And then praying with people. I want to encourage you to really, if you, if you love Jesus, if you're talking with a friend or a family member, somebody who doesn't know Jesus, and they share a deep burden, a deep pain, a deep sorrow, will you dare at that moment to look at them and say, listen, I don't know if you do the whole prayer thing, but I believe there's power in prayer. Would you mind if right now I just took a moment and said a prayer for what you just shared? I've done that thousands of times since I've been a Christian with non-believers. I've had three people tell me no. Only three. And none of them like beat me up or ran away. They just said, I'm not into that. But I can't tell you how many. I was on the East Coast not long ago and I was, I was in this kind of social setting with about 30, 40 people around this kind of big giant island in this kitchen with food and beverages. People just hanging out and talking and stuff. And I'm talking with this woman who's actually, uh, her and her husband owned this house. And we were just talking and I asked about her family. She told me about her daughters and they were doing well but then she told me about her son. So he's had some emotional and um, mental challenges. And he just got married, but some of that stuff's coming up, and it's really a challenge. His marriage is a challenge. And she just shared this, you know, the heart of a mom 
for her son who she's looking going, How is he going to make this? And I just said quietly to her, I said, listen, I, and I know she's not a person of like church goer, that kind of stuff, but I just said, you know, listen, I believe there's power in prayer. And it would mean so much to me if you would just let me take a moment and pray for your son. She didn't yell and scream and run away. She said, would you do that? I said, oh, yeah. I started to pray, and I'm kind of careful about boundaries and stuff, just with women, but, but she like leaned right into me. And I kind of put my arm around her shoulder, and she's almost kind of melted into my shoulder. And just, it was like the Holy Spirit showed up, and the power of God was there in her dining room. Other people are talking and visiting, and we had a little church together. You can do that. God hears your prayers. And when you pray with non-believers, God shows up in those moments. Do that more and more and more. And then praying with faith. Will you dare to pray, God, I'm asking you to lead me, and even if you lead me somewhere I'm not planning on going, I'm going to follow. Prayers of faith say, God, I will follow your ways. And I want to share a little story with you about a couple, uh, a couple who really, uh, Walt and Liz Bennett, Walt was a uh, kind of the VP uh, of a large insurance group right here on Garden Road and soon to become the, the president of the company, was attending Shoreline Church here and received a challenge from the heart of God and from some people to consider leaving that world and lead Organic Outreach International, the ministry that, that God was birthing out of Shoreline Church. And I want you to hear just a little bit of his story and his wife Liz's story and how prayer became prayers of faith have a huge impact. Go ahead and watch the screens. So when they shared the vision with the staff um, to start this full-blown ministry around organic outreach, it, it immediately resonated with me. And, and when they were done with the presentation, I actually went up to Kevin and said, hey, you don't know me. Um, we've been coming here for a while, but, but the organic outreach idea, I said, that ministry has to happen. Um, and he said, great, I, I feel the same way. And so uh, we actually went to lunch, uh, went to several lunches. And um, through the course of that, you know, just dreaming and planning what it might look like. And, and finally, Kevin came down to the question, so where are you on recognizing that you're the guy that God has to run this thing? And um, my initial reaction was to, to chuckle a little bit. Um, I said, you know, I'm a numbers guy and I just don't see how this works. We live in one of the most expensive places in the country. We still have two more kids to put through college. Uh, I know this would make a fraction of what I make now from a, a compensation perspective, and I, I just don't see the math working out. And and he just encouraged. He said, "Well, you know, that being what it is, just pray about it, and uh, and we'll talk more." And I've been praying about it since that first lunch. Um, and I think that for me, it wasn't as much about the numbers. I wasn't worried about that. I was more concerned of what it would look like for Walt to be a pastor and for me to be a pastor's wife. How would that change things for us, for our family, and, and what would those responsibilities be? So we, we did pray about it. We prayed about it separately. We prayed about it together. Um, and, and really, you know, when it boils down to a prayer, it's really a, a just at its core seeking to be in alignment with God's will. And, and that's what came through. Uh, we finally got to this point where it was just crystal clear that God has had brought us to this place at this time for this exact purpose. And if that's the case, then we recognize all the concerns that we have are things that we need to let go of. We need to trust God that he's got a plan for us that's beyond what we can see. Uh, and so it was about two weeks later, I let Kevin know, actually happened to be the first day of the conference that year. I just stepped on the shoulder and said, we'll talk later, um, 100%. We'll figure it out. Um, well, and this isn't the first time that prayer has given us peace and clarity. It's something that's a big part of our life. And it's something that I'm, I'm in a lot of conversation with God. It can be driving and praying about the driver in front of me, seeing the man on the side of the road, big things and little things. And it's like, as Walt said, it's seeking to be in line with what the spirit is doing, not ahead, not behind. Um, and so having prayer be a big part of things. This was a natural result for us to get this clarity because we left it up to him, not to us. And there's a link with our whole testimony on the Shoreline website if you want to hear more about Walt and Liz's journey. But, you know, Walt is a numbers guy. And he, uh, when we were having lunch, and I said to him, would you pray about being open to maybe, maybe God's calling you to leave the business world and to run this international ministry, which was just being birthed. And he actually literally kind of laughed. He was going, yeah, yeah. That's not going to happen kind of a thing. And each time we would talk, he'd say, well, he'd say, like, okay, I'm 30% open to it. He'd pray a little bit more. 
I'm 50% open to it. And he walked up to me just up in the hallway up there uh, through that exit door right out there at one of our conferences and just tapped me on the shoulder and he just said, we'll talk later, 100%. Prayers of faith can change the world by changing you. And he's the one that was just over in Kenya training 300 pastors and has an amazing ministry that's, that's, that's touching people all over the world. But a new place. One last thought. Praying with the heart of God. We need to pray with the heart of God for our world. Listen to these words from Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went through all the towns and all the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were like, they were harassed and helpless, just like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus said to his followers, organic disciples, right? Jesus said to his followers, to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Jesus, this is our prayer. We ask you, the Lord of the harvest, you, you died on the cross, you rose again, you bring salvation, not us. But we're your messengers, we're your ambassadors, we're your mouthpiece in this world to share your good news. So Lord of the harvest, send workers out into the harvest field. Make us people of prayer who learn from Jesus, who pray like Jesus. But Lord, let our prayers propel us out with the good news. Lord of the harvest, send workers out into the harvest field. And we, may we be the first to hear that call and to go, and to go, and to go. In the name of Jesus, amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple of invitations, things to be tuned into. Uh, one is that every week during the series, if you go on the front of the Shoreline website or on the email you get on Sunday, there's links to resources. So right now there's links for prayer resources. So just click on some of those links. Learn about prayer at Shoreline Church. If you want to get trained to be a part of our prayer team here at 1 o'clock today, Pastor Dennis is going to do some training for that. If you want to pray globally, you want to pray with Organic Outreach International, a ministry that's birthed out of Shoreline Church, that's impacting churches all over the world and leaders all over the world, just go in the courtyard here or if you're online, send us an email or a text and just say, I want to be on the prayer team for Organic Outreach International. There's also a booth in the courtyard here if you want to check in there on your way out and sign up and get more information about that. If you need prayer today for anything, if you're online, simply call the number you see there or email a prayer to the, the email address you see there. If you're on campus, we have a team that will be up front here, and we would love to pray for you following the service. Our team's already up here waiting and excited to pray for you. If you're new at Shoreline, we're so glad you're here. If you're on campus, do one thing for us before you leave. Go by the Connection Center and just tell them you're new. And they'll want to give you a gift bag and answer your questions and give you a warm welcome. If you're online... Just text the word welcome to the phone number you see there, uh, and then what we'll do is we'll send you a digital connection card, and we'll get to know you online until you're able to be on campus if so that happens down the road. I'm leading a membership class today. If you want to know more about becoming a member of Shoreline, no pressure, but if you want to know more, at 1.30 or at 12.30 today in the Pacific Room, and it'll also be online. So you can go register on the website and join me online, or on campus, it'll be a hybrid class. I'll be talking to people online and in the room at the same time and walking through membership. And then, again, if you want to join into different kinds of prayer, contact the church, and we would love to get you engaged in praying in the life of Shoreline. If you're able to stand, whether you're online or here on campus, will you stand with me and let me send you off with a word of blessing? As we close this time together, may the prayer life of Jesus so inspire you that you'll draw closer to God than you've ever been in your daily conversations. May you know that he tore the curtain apart to invite you in. And you are always welcome. Pray continually. Pray boldly. Pray in faith. Pray in surrender. And pray in power for the world to know the love of Jesus. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll see you next Sunday morning.